Hi there everyone, it's John. Uh, welcome back to my channel. It's Wednesday, so I have another book review for you. It's uh, June 2nd, 2021 to be specific. And the book review I wanted to do for you today is on one of those books that every once in a while I'm just sort of... I find myself just really wanting to read. It's, it's one of those books that... Um, Again, like I say, you always find referenced in bibliographies. You see them at the end of reading lists and, and footnote sections, etc. And uh, this book is uh, nearly 50 years old. Uh, Peter Bur Burke, as far as I know, is still around and writing. Um, sorry for the glare there. I have the, the back window open. The, uh, this, the book is called The Italian Renaissance, Culture and Society in Italy by Peter Burke. It's put out by, um, uh, yeah, it's a Princeton paperback. Um, love the, the, um, Carlo Crivelli Annunciation with St. Emidius, uh, on the front. Um, so what, I want to talk about what kind of book this is, and then sort of do my traditional review, but this, this subtitle here, um, culture and society in Italy is doing a lot of work, and I kind of wanted to let anyone know who might be interested in reading a book on the Italian Renaissance, what kind of book this is and what kind of book it's not. So this book might not be the particular kind that most readers are seeking out. Uh, like I said, especially considering the title, which makes it seem like it's all about the artistic and cultural achievements of the Italian Renaissance. You won't read, for example, about the symbolism of the uh, elongated figures and painters like uh, Parmigianino or uh, Ghiberti's uh, doors at the Florence Baptistery. Uh, these and other, like I said, artistic, painterly, musical considerations uh, sort of loom in the margins in this book. But the bulk of the book is dedicated to something else. It is a methodological study uh, on how Italian politics, economics, and society allowed for innovations in culture, uh, excuse me, in uh, literature, painting, architecture, and music that we see develop in this time period. And in this time period, I mean mostly the 15th and 16th centuries. Peter Burke isn't offering up necessarily a Marxist analysis here, but he is imagining something like Marx's base superstructure argument, uh, which might be a good sort of analogy. Uh, the base being, if you're unfamiliar with what uh, Marx wrote about, the base being sort of the social forces and relationships, uh, relationships of production, like labor conditions and guilds, and patronage systems and things like that that allow for the specific kinds of artistic accomplishments and achievements that we see develop. It's pre precisely this cultural and, and social base um, that Burke is really interested in looking at and not so much what that base produces artistically. So to draw the conclusions uh, that he's interested in, Burke hones in on a list of about 600 what he calls uh, uh, Womini Illustri, or uh, famous men, illustrious men. Uh, they consist of artists, scholars, humanists, writers, etc. And he analyzes the list in different ways. Um, he asks, where were they born? Again, this is, uh, this is just a list of Italian artists and scholars and writers. So what region or state of Italy were they born? Um, what did their fathers do? Um, what was the extent and what was the type of their education? Uh, uh, what were their uh, major, were their major patrons either secular or religious? And from there, he presents sort of a, um, a, a series of topical chapters 
then analyze the data for the questions that he's that he's trying to ask. For example, chapter three is called Artists and Writers, and it compares and contrasts the levels of humanistic education between the two groups. Artists, as it happens to turn out, tended to have uh, less of this kind of education, humanistic education, than uh, writers did. The Italian Renaissance is often historically interpreted to be an important source of ideas about artistic individualism. And while this might be true later in the Renaissance, uh, Burke argues, the times when painters and other artists were professionally associated with guilds tended to decrease the amount of what we would come to eventually call style, which we usually associate today with individual artists. Uh, chapter 4 takes up the issue of patronage, which of course in the Renaissance is extraordinarily important. Uh, early on in the Renaissance, patrons exerted careful control over artistic production that they commissioned, but as time wore on into the 16th century, artists began to enjoy more and more intellectual independence regarding their subject matters. Uh, Burke also emphasizes the point that the artwork strictly as a means of aesthetic contemplation comes along much, much, much later, post-Renaissance, uh, perhaps as late as the 17th or uh, the 18th century. And in the Renaissance, patrons uh, would present artists with commissions for the purpose of communicating religious ideas or important literary ideas to a large, um, uh, increasingly literate, but still largely illiterate um, uh, public. So this was, <laughs> of course, in the Middle Ages, you see sort of a, um, a peak in illiteracy. So uh, public art, church art, was um, absolutely essential in communicating messages of hell, damnation, salvation, um, etc. And it, during the, the Renaissance, you see education start to increase, but mostly for only very well-educated families. Or, not, <laughs> that begs the question, for, for families who could afford it. Uh, and sort of Everyone else came much later as far as learning how to read and write. But, um, but learning how to communicate those religious messages was still important, and that was, was largely the main thrust in a lot of uh, Renaissance uh, commissions. If this book could be said to have one drawback, it's that the artists and the writers that are mentioned... Uh, are, are are usually kind of seem like they're a little bit name droppy, um, <laughs> which can it can render the prose a little bit on the tedious and the academic side. Um, and that's coming from me, who who reads <laughs> books like this on a regular basis. Um, you get strings of sentences like this, and I'll I'll just give you an example. These kinds of sentences are not uncommon. Uh, from the late 14th century, mechanical clocks came into use. A famous one was constructed at Padua to the design of Giovanni Dondi, physician astronomer who was a friend of Petrarch and completed in 1364. About 1460, a clock was made for the town hall at Bologna. In 1478, one for the Castello Sforzo in Milan and in 1499, one for the Piazza del San Marco in Venice, and so on. By the late 15th century, portable clocks were coming in. In Filaret's Utopia, the schools for boys and girls had an alarm clock in each dormitory. This idea, at least, was not purely utopian, for in Milan in, 16, in 1463, the astrologer uh, Giacomo de Piacenza had an alarm clock by his bed. These names, uh, Filaret, Giacomo di P Piacenza, um, Giovanni Dondi, 
These are probably names that most people don't know. I didn't recognize any of the three. Um, and he just mentions each one of them once and then says nothing about them again. Um, so it's... And th th that happens quite a bit when he's referencing that list of 600 famous men that I, and each, well, it's like 98% men. I was going to say they're all men, but not every single one of them was. Um, so many of them in there are not known to most people. You know, we, we probably recognize if you're, you know, okay with the Italian Renaissance, you might recognize what, you know, 30, 40, 50 names. But he just drops them all over the place, not for the purpose of analyzing, but but he'll just mention them for one one specific sentence, and then and then no more. But if you if you, you can wade yourself through prose like that, um, it's a worthwhile book, especially if you're interested in sort of that material culture that undergirds the artistic accomplishments of the Renaissance. Um, I read it because, like I said earlier, I'd often seen it on syllabi uh, for courses in the Renaissance and early modern uh, European history. It was written in the early 1970s, uh, just as historians were just starting to think about seriously uh, not just modes of you know, literary and artistic production, but cultural and social modes of of uh, the, the kind of history that allowed that production to occur. And for that alone, I think it's an interesting kind of history to write and an interesting one to read. His opinions are worth reading, you know, if only to see how they influence subsequent historians, and there have been many of them, considering it was written 50 years ago, who were also concerned with sort of the interstices of social, economic, cultural, and intellectual production. So, if that is, as they say, your bag, uh, check it out. The Italian Renaissance, Culture and Society in Italy. Uh, like I said, mostly 15th and 16th century Italy by Peter Burke. And with that, I will see you next week. Bye, everyone.